Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Benoit de Maillet. Uh, he was a Frenchman and a diplomat in Egypt. And um, he wrote a book which doesn't get mentioned nearly often enough. And uh, the title is long, and it tells you a lot about the book. <laughs> the title is Tilly Ahmed, or Discourses Between an Indian Philosopher and a French Missionary, uh, which would be himself, on the diminution of the sea, the formation of the earth, the origin of men and animals, and other curious subjects relating to natural history and philosophy. Um, and in this book, it's not clear exactly when it was written, um, but sometime before he died, we can be sure of that. Uh, he outlines a theory of transformation over time of Earth and its inhabitants. And he did the same thing that Galileo did. When you've got something dangerous to talk about, you put it in the mouths of other people, and you let them talk about it. So he had this dialogue uh, going between uh, the Indian philosopher and the French missionary about, you know, what if scenarios about uh, how life and the earth might have what we would say now evolved. And it's pretty clearly he was talking about uh, natural change over time. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who in my view has been given a very raw deal by history, um, he published um, Philosophy of Zoology in 1809 and it's reasonable to point to this as uh, one of the very first evolutionary trees. This was all about uh, organic evolution, uh, genealogy of organisms. So here's the diagram um, from his book almost 200 years now uh, ago. And he's got many things right there. You can see he's got whales uh, in with mammalia, which is better than Herman Melville did. And, um, <laughs> He's got, he got some things wrong, but he got some things right. He's remembered, of course, for the notion of um, animals wanting to change in certain directions or the inheritance of acquired characters, and he's vilified for that. But it wasn't, that really wasn't original with him. Everybody believed that at the time. And even Darwin um, gave some air to the notion of inheritance of acquired characters. Uh, but that has, you know, that, uh, his name has been attached to that. And, um, people realize, to a lesser degree, uh, the extent to which he really talked about evolutionary history as something uh, real. Charles Darwin, of course, um, this is a page out of his notebook from 1837. And we know that he was one of us, meaning evolutionary biologists, because as you can see in his slide, it says, I think tree. <laughs> what else can you say? I mean, it's all right there. This is how you think about the history of organismal change over time, 1837. Uh, and what I really like about his tree is that it's an unrooted network, um, which is a, an honest tree uh, in a lot of ways, because often we don't know in any particular group of organisms which one might be the earliest split, the oldest divergence within some group. So certainly Darwin was uh, all about evolutionary history. And um, uh, in my view, really, he built on this notion that was circulating amongst people with a scientific bent uh, for quite a while. He provided the real mechanism in his, um, in his discourse on uh, natural selection. So he provided the mechanism that uh, had been missing. Ernst Haeckel is another historical figure we can talk about who published this tree in 1866. It's also a tree of life. Um, and at that time, he's got, there's three basic groups, plants, animals, and protists. And there's a bunch of names here. Uh, this, he was a contemporary of Darwin's um, on the European continent. Um, and he was a great champion of uh, evolutionary biology, what we would call it as well. So that's a little bit of the, uh, the history. And there was a long history before Charles Darwin, was, is one of my points. So I thought it would be good just to talk briefly about what the actual evidence is, what some of the categories. And here I'll just scratch the surface. Um, 
There's been abundant time available, and we know this now from radiometric dating of fossils and associated rocks. Radiometric dating is a key part of the evidence for evolution. It's based on the constant rate of decay for unstable parent isotopes into daughter isotopes, isotopes being species of atoms based on the numbers of neutrons and protons. For example, half of an amount of carbon-14 decays to carbon-12 in about 5,730 years. And measuring the relative amounts of the two isotopes in a sample gives the age of that sample. Carbon-14, carbon-12 is just one of many systems that's good just for relatively recent samples. Uh, potassium argon, for example, is another one that's useful over much longer evolutionary time periods. Other evidence for e evolution has to do with the fact that we find the same order of fossil appearance uh, all over the world. If you look at this slide, um, we'll see if I can find the noisy spot here. Um, here would be a random appearance of uh, organisms that you might find based on their fossil forms, just at random. They would be scrambled. Uh, and here is the, uh, the pattern which actually is found, starting with certain organisms. In this case, there's some protists down here. Uh, we've got some fungi, um, some plants, some vertebrates. This is found over and over again, regardless of where you were looking for fossils. Uh, occasionally, it'll be turned over, but then that's because of some events of Earth history shuffling the order. But we find the same order, and it's also consistent with the, uh, the tree of life. We find the earliest divergences involving uh, some of these primary lineages and the more recent divergences uh, distinguishing some of the lineages that we find uh, in the younger rocks. So we've got radiometric dating and we've got the order of fossil appearance in time. Here's our time scale from long ago to recent. Um, embryological similarities this is just a quick um, sketch showing uh, three forms for a fish, a salamander, tortoise, chick, pig, calf, rabbit, human. Early, late. And if we just look at the middle series, it's pointing to the gills, where the gills occur in all of these forms. And so we find some embryological similarities uh, across very different uh, forms of vertebrates in this case. Um, and so actually Ernst uh, Haeckel was one who talked about uh, things like this and the notion of ontogeny, growth, recapitulating phylogeny, the series of relationships. It's sort of a mouthful, and it's often contradicted, but in some cases it is true that we find the stages of growth um, give us some information about uh, the relationships of organisms. So here's pointing to our uh, former gills, which all of us had at one point very early on in our lives. We also had tails, uh, which in most all cases are lost. Uh, there are a small incidence of uh, human infants being born with tails, which are quickly uh, cut off. So the, the genetic material is still there. Vestigial characters are, of course, powerful evolution, and Darwin <coughs> talked about them a lot. Here's four different creatures that live in caves, all of which have only vestigial eyes left. There's a cave salamander, a water louse, uh, and a Sherison fish. This flightless weevil has underneath this sealed carapace Wings, wings that will never see the light of day, wings that never get used, uh, but they're there. Um, they can't even be exposed at this point because uh, in many other weevils, this carapace will split open and the wings can get used. Uh, so that's also evidence for evolution. Why would organism, an organism like that have wings if there were not, um, you know, if it had not descended from some other form uh, that used the wings? And this is an interesting example, which I like, because everyone is familiar with the dandelions, uh, which they try to cultivate in their yards uh, during <laughs> spring and summer. Um, I think if we just got everyone thinking that dandelions were good, we could all save ourselves a lot of time and effort. Um, and here are the vestigial flowers and the vestigial pollen grain of these asexual forms. Um, why do that if there's not evolutionary change, if these not, were not descended from sexually reproducing groups? Um, here is the North Island brown kiwi from New Zealand. Very interesting uh, bird, which is much like a mammal in many ways. Its feathers have become almost hair-like. It's fossorial. It burrows underground. Well, it, it lays its egg and nests underground. Um, 
there's an interesting situation with the kiwi in that it appears to have been descended from a formerly much larger um, lineage species, so to speak. So here's a female with an egg. You can see the egg in the outline here taking up uh, the vast majority of the body cavity. Uh, so while there was selection for reduction in size of the kiwi, there was not the same selection on the egg. And so uh, laying an egg for a kiwi is a very difficult and dangerous enterprise. Uh, it takes a lot of work. Um, and there's a fair amount of mortality that goes on there. Uh, so that's also some evidence that, um, uh, of evolution. And this is sort of, you might put this under suboptimal design. <laughs> <coughs> Evolution's full of suboptimal design. Atavistic characters uh, are more evidence for evolution. Um, Species on the lineage of modern horse ordinarily had three toes. There's a common trend towards reduction in the number of digits uh, within uh, some groups of mammals. And occasionally, you'll find modern horses uh, that are born and still have some of these side toes. That would be an atavistic character. This is an evolutionary throwback. Hypertrichosis, uh, like this individual here is displaying, is another atavistic trait. The genes are there uh, on occasion. Uh, through mutations uh, and ch uh, particular uh, changes in the environment of development, these can be expressed. So again, this is evidence for evolutionary change over time that we still have the genetic material for these, what we would think about as uh, earlier traits. More evidence, shared features being consistent with shared ancestry. Sometimes shared features have somewhat different functions, the forelimb of a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. Um, these are the same bones. These are what we would call homologous bones, the same bones because of being uh, inherited <clears throat> from a common ancestor, but with slightly different functions. And sometimes these shared features have the same function as we find with the genetic code. The genetic code is shared by all life forms. Um, all of them. There are some minor variations, but where we find those minor variations, they tend to be found among close relatives. So that's evidence for evolution as well. Um, the homeotic genes are important in uh, the development of organisms, and they also provide evidence for evolution. So here's just a map um, showing a linear sequence of DNA with uh, some of the homeotic genes and what their expression controls uh, in the fruit fly embryo. Uh, so it's involved in segmentation here. And it's the same genes in a mouse which are involved in the development of the segments or the portions of the developing mouse embryo. And in fact, in some organisms, it's possible to mix and match uh, some of these uh, homeotic genes as an indication of their, their shared evolutionary history. We find that the geographic boundaries for species often reflect, often, <laughs> species distributions often reflect geographic boundaries. So here's showing the geographic boundaries for three uh, very closely related sister species of Saki monkeys. And this is consistent with the notion that they have evolved in C2 in these different geographic regions. Um, they have split into three different species. And we find this uh, sort of um, pattern in many different organisms. More evidence for evolution being uh, that what we understand about the geographic distribution of organisms makes sense in light of uh, plate tectonics and the changing position of continents on our planet. So you remember all that? <laughs> I'll do this again. I think this, uh, this is really a lot of fun. Um, so if we go back to the end of the Cambrian about 500 million years ago, so those numbers are millions of years, approximately. And um, this is interesting. Here you can see Gondwana land. Here's South America, Africa, what will become Antarctica and Australia. And we find shared distributions of organisms across these southern continents uh, over and over again, at least in different groups of vertebrates. Uh, and so the evolution of them, um, their relationships make sense in the light of the movement of continents uh, around the planet. Um, and what's really interesting, watch what happens to India here as it goes uh, screaming across, smashing into the Asian continent and creating the Himalayas as you would push a rug up against a wall.
one last time for anyone that didn't get it the first time. <laughs> there you go. Boom. All right, so I've talked a little bit about um, the age of the Earth. And we, this is an interesting uh, figure that was published in a, in a paper in Nature just a couple of months ago um, and puts it together in a way that's easy to grasp, I think. <clears throat> so here's, uh, here's our planet. Um, the numbers are billions of years. So origin of Earth about, this is a half mark, about 4.6 billion years ago. So for a long time, uh, Earth was just settling in some ways. Uh, life emerged from uh, inanimate uh, entities on the planet. Uh, shortly after, we have phototrophic bacteria helping to oxygenate the universe. Uh, I'm sorry, the planet, cyanobacteria plus other phototrophs, and so on. Here we go, four billion, three billion, two billion, one billion years ago, um, and mammals just arising about at this point, and here are humans. So uh, as we proceed, this, this is a useful thing to keep in mind. Here's a photograph of a, um, a volcanic outcropping also in New Zealand, which I use just as sort of a, um, uh, a proxy for um, early Earth, relatively early Earth, and uh, the emergence of uh, biotic forms from abiotic forms. So here's an initial structure that we can use to start talking about this. Um, you can note in colors up here, they're talking about three different domains. The actual names used here are arbitrary, whether they're kingdoms or domains or anything else. We just, we can talk at least about three primary groups, bacteria with a capital B, archaea, the capital A, and eukarya, and this would be our group over here. So the three primary groups, uh, two of them are different kinds of bacteria. <clears throat> and we'll take a look at some of these. Um, here is uh, a representative archaea. These are some electron micrographs, just giving you an idea uh, of what they look like. These are fascinating forms capable of living in very extreme environments. Many of them are what we would call um, extremophiles, because they can live at super hot, super cold temperatures, uh, extremely highly acid conditions, uh, and so on, places where we could not live very long. Here's a hot springs at Yellowstone to give you some idea <clears throat> of what some of their habitats are like. And of course, being able to survive in habitats like that mean they can do a lot of things at the molecular level that are potentially useful to us, things we can't do, uh, such as have our genetic material replicate at near boiling temperatures. Um, that's a very, that's a difficult thing and a useful thing potentially um, for humans to pick up on and, and molecular biologists have in isolating the polymerase for doing PCR experiments um, from Thermus aquaticus, for example, is one, uh, one taxon. Here's a thermosopho, another an anaerobic extreme thermophile. That's actually several cells. The arrows there are pointing to individual uh, archibacterial cells. This is a photograph of a solar saltern uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the reddish cast down here. These are halophilic bacteria, halophiles, salt-loving bacteria. Here's one next to a salt crystal for scale. Uh, these are archaea. These are extremophiles. <clears throat> There's a cow, which will be <laughs> immediately recognizable to many, uh, and a methanogen, a kind of bacteria that the cow graciously provides a home for. Uh, the bacteria is useful to the cow, or is helpful in helping to digest cellulose. Um, this is a methanogen, um, and they are uh, helping create methane and living in methane-rich environments. And in fact, they're absolutely necessary for cows to make a living. We have, we have bacteria in our guts, E. coli, which are also uh, absolutely necessary for our living. There are um, lots of insects that also have methanogenic bacteria living with them in their guts, and, and termites are an example. And uh, if you ever want to see something interesting, 
Uh, if you happen to be in Africa watching a termite mound after a rain, when the rain has sealed the aeration pores in the termite mound, whereby the methane is ordinarily drained out of the mound, the methane will begin to build up. Now, you have to have really good luck for this. Uh, and to see a lightning bolt hit that termite mound, <laughs> you'll get a fantastic explosion. Just <laughs> incredible. Yeah, yeah. This could be a good use for the internet, I suppose, and <laughs> letting people know when these uh, are open. So we've been talking about some archaea, halophiles, methanogens. We'll talk a little bit about bacteria here, and this another rendition of the tree. Um, here are some stromatolites. These are um, limestone mats which are precipitated from communities of cyanobacteria. So this is a fossil evidence of a community of cyanobacteria dated to about 2.8 billion years ago. Here are some close-ups of some fossil cyanobacteria. These are nostoc uh, cyanobacteria. It's a common photobiont. That means it's a, uh, it'll often develop some sort of a symbiotic uh, relationship with some other forms of life and what they provide is a capability for photosynthesis. They enter into these relationships with uh, algae, fungi, lichens, mosses, cycads, mm -hmm. ferns, marine sponges, marine flatworms, and anything else. I've been trying to get into one of these relationships myself, um, <laughs> but haven't had any luck. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to photosynthesize. Um, and no stock are possibly quite the best at this. Uh, and, you know, the role of organisms like this in oxygenating our planet is just huge. Um, here is a uh, photograph of the uh, bacterium that is responsible for syphilis. Uh, the corkscrew-shaped cells of uh, syphilis causing spirochete treponema pallidum. Here's a photograph of Robert Koch, and um, of course his work in learning how to stain bacteria has been very important for microbiologists, for all of us really, in coming to recognize the broad diversity of bacteria that are out there. Uh, these are actually uh, anthrax bacteria, uh, which we were first able to see because of some, what now in hindsight looked like simple experiments in making them take up a stain and then putting them under a microscope to be able to see them. These are some of the endospores, which are capable of surviving in the soil for decades, possibly over 100 years in some cases. So that's a very successful life history strategy for a bacterium. Um, so uh, you, the bacteria are a huge group, um, as are archaea. We know more about bacteria uh, the diversity of bacteria than we do archaea, and that to, to some degree is an artifact of where we have looked. So just to sort of recap where we are so far, we're talking about the origin of Earth about four and a half billion years ago. Um, we have talked about, looked at some bacteria and some archaea, the extremophiles here. Um, as they are evolving, we're finding greater accumulation of atmospheric oxygen from these photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. Um, making the uh, evolution of other life forms possible. You know, when these guys were getting started, uh, forms that required oxygen wouldn't have had a chance, obviously. And so there's a, a strong degree of contingency for all of these forms. Um, what's been going on lately as far as discoveries for um, some of the, what we might consider uh, microscopic eukaryotes, microbial forms, where there's been a great deal of discovery recently for um, our own group for a moment now. We're talking about eukaryotes. Um, so since 2000, many new groups of extremely small eukaryotes have been discovered, and some of these are as small as bacteria, but they are eukaryotes. They have true nuclei. The, the method for their discovery is called uh, culture-independent PCR, abbreviated CI-PCR, which amplifies DNA directly from soil or water samples, uh, and it will bypass the need to identify morphologically these new samples, these new uh, organisms, which are microscopic. Uh, most such habitats remain to be uh, explored in this way. Um, 
and these newly discovered eukaryotes are phylogenetically scattered throughout the tree. They're really changing our notion of within eukaryotes, what are the phylogenetic relationships? Uh, and just in the past uh, four or five years, this technique has more than doubled the number of named phyla for bacteria and archaea as well as a byproduct of just doing some exploration. So we had no idea this diversity was there until people started taking environmental samples like a bucket of seawater or a scoop of soil, um, isolating the DNA from the organisms in those through a series of um, just some basic uh, biochemistry and filtering, um, and then doing the sequencing and seeing what you've got. Here is a tree um, for some for eukaryotes, for our group. It's an unrooted network. Um, we are here. Here are animals right in here. We are actually apisthecons, so if you'd like to add that to your self-description, uh, <laughs> feel free. You are an apisthecont, uh, together with the microsporidia and the fungi. Um, all of these black dotted lines are new lineages that have been added within the last four or five years using culture independent PCR. Uh, so they're really throughout the tree and it makes some sense in hindsight. Yeah, there's got to be forms out there that are microscopic, that things that we just haven't seen yet and we don't know about them until we just start doing some sequencing um, to look for them uh, and then try to fit them in um, to the phylogeny for the tree of life. So we'll take a look at some more forms. Here is a uh, a heterocont, this is a diatom, the silica skeleton of one. These are nucleated single-celled organisms. It's one of us also, a eukaryote. Here's another heterocont, a brown alga. This tree is just showing all the different places where things called algae occurred. Algae is, uh, at this point, it's, it's meaningless in terms of phylogeny uh, because of the history of the use of the terms. We've got brown algae here, red algae here, green algae here blue-green algae down below. Uh, these would be the cyanobacteria. Um, so algae doesn't help if you're trying to talk about a particular lineage in the tree of life. Um, uh, plants, a fantastic mm -hmm. group, and I know that there's some botanists uh, in the audience that would like me to stop here and uh, just talk about plants all day, but that wouldn't be good because uh, I'm not an expert on plants. So uh, green algae, phylum chlorophyta, appears to be a primitive plant form. Um, alveolates, and here is a representative dinoflagellate in the genus Peridinium. Um, it's a single-celled eukaryote. These are the group that's responsible for toxic red tides. One of the interesting things about dinoflagellates is they have multiple genomes, which result from one organism engulfing another and then the one that gets engulfed and the engulfer over evolutionary time work out some sort of an arrangement uh, where they can both survive, at least in part, uh, and then you are left with multiple genomes. We have multiple genomes. We have a nuclear genome and a mitochondrial genome. Plants add uh, chloroplast genomes to that uh, to have three genomes. Uh, dinoflagellates in some cases have as many as five or six different genomes, so it really is not one thing. It's a multiplicity of things. It's a community over, if you want to think of it that way, that has evolved over time. And we can recover some of that information. Here's a fascinating organism. Here's a slime mold, uh, amoebozoa. Uh, this has been claimed variously by botanists to be part of their group. It's been claimed by zoologists to be part of their group, and they're both wrong. Uh, it's really, uh, it's a strange kind of uh, uh, protestin. Uh, sorry, protozoan, um, so it's neither fungi, it's not, a, it's not technically a mold, it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's its own thing. Uh, and we're not exactly sure where it goes phylogenetically, and in fact there are different kinds of slime molds that are not uh, closely related to each other. They're alternatively solitary, and then sometimes unicellular, as you see here. You can see these if you go uh, walking uh, in the woods in Waterloo, Pinckney area, if you're, if you're lucky you can find uh, slime molds. They'll suddenly peer up. They can move as much as a centimeter in a week. Um, maybe more in some cases. And they're very, they're becoming important experimentally because uh, they have some large cells that are useful for people doing cell biology sorts of things. Here are two examples of ex, uh, excavates. The top one is a 
uh, giardia, which is a eukaryote that lacks mitochondria. It's sort of a raging question whether it lacks mitochondria and always has, or whether it once had it and has lost it. Uh, and a trichomonas uh, down below. Both of these are parasitic. <clears throat> Okay, um, origins of plants, roughly, um, we'll say around 490 million years ago, we got, uh, in this very simplistic tree, we've got um, a group that includes the green algae, the bryophytes, for example, the mosses, seedless vascular plants, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. And I can see I better get moving. Here are some um, examples of some. Liverwort, um, moss, sphagnum moss, hornworts here. <laughs> Some examples of seedless vascular plants. Uh, a horsetail, equisetum, with everyone is familiar with, a whisk fern, quillwort. <clears throat> Some gymnosperms, the giant sequoia, ephedra in the upper right, and uh, juniper with berries. Angiosperms, such as the orchid, uh, hyacinth and the fireweed up here. And yet more, angiosperms are so beautiful. Saguaro cactus in the lower Sonoran Desert with some ocotillo, you can see the red flowers, uh, and a Venus flytrap. So they have carnivores or predators too. Um, fungi, we can talk about four primary lineages of fungi. I won't uh, bore you with the names, but we'll look at a couple pictures here. Um, some in the genus Tremella, uh, in the genus Tremedes, the common name here is a turkey tail fungus, and here's the carbon fungus. Um, this is a very interesting and important group of organisms um, for human beings. Uh, it includes yeasts and penicillin, which is this particular uh, fungus is a source of penicillin, and yeasts, of course, are important for all kinds of fermentation activities, including bread. It's probably not what you were thinking. Maybe it was. Um, this is a picture of Mars, uh, a place that, as far as we know, has no fungi or other forms of life, as far as we know. This is another round object that does have a lot of fungi. This is an orange uh, with a lot of mold growing on it. I don't know why this photograph sort of appealed to me. Um, Here's a rock with some lichens on it, and many of you may know that lichens are in fact two things. Um, it's a photobiont, such as something like nostoc um, or cyanobacteria, uh, entering into a symbiotic relationship with a, with a fungus to lichenize this life form. So a lichens really are, there are two different lineages of, of life forms coming together to, to take this emergent uh, condition of being a lichen. And um, this was first discovered by Beatrix Potter, actually, the uh, author of Peter and the Rabbit. <clears throat> it was hard finding a job if you were a biologist as a female in the uh, late 1800s. And so she um, made some fantastic observations and then went into writing books and continued with some of her observations as well. Here is a, here is a red sponge. Um, we'll go fairly quickly through that. Here's a cnidarian, um, a jellyfish, radially symmetrical, not bilaterally symmetrical like we are. Here is a hard coral. So we're sort of moving up uh, the tree um, a bit. Now there are many ways to be a worm. Um, here is something we know as a flat worm. This is platyhelminthes. This is an earthworm. Of course, which can have, can have anywhere between seven to 15 hearts, which are really just sort of uh, small pumps in the vascular system. Uh, you can be a roundworm, like this nematode. And actually, there's two of them in this picture. Here's a small male uh, mating with a larger female. So size matters in this case, um, <laughs> but in the opposite direction, perhaps. You could also be a ribbon worm. Um, these are uh, nemertia 
is the genus, and these are voracious carnivores, and so you want to watch out uh, if you come into contact with any of these. These are also known as bootlace worms, and what looks like a small worm, if you go to pick it up, can suddenly just expand to be very big. Um, they can be three or four meters in length when they stretch out. So it's a pretty obvious shape, and it has uh, evolved independently in multiple lineages. Here are some pictures of some bryozoans. Um, the one on the bottom actually is from Lake Michigan. These are sometimes called moss animals. Some arthropods, um, horseshoe crabs at the bottom, uh, and a shorthand commensal shrimp above. Oshima's porcelain crab. Here are some arthropods. A bombardier beetle in the upper left um, shooting from his twin exhausts in his tail uh, a, a very hot noxious gas which it uses to dissuade anybody that would like to mess with them or predators. There's actually over 200 and 2,500 different species of bombardier beetles that are known. Um, here's two arachnids, here's some millipedes, and here's a bunch of uh, drawers out of an insect collection, showing some lepidopterans in that case. Here are a couple nudibranchs. This is Phylum mollusca, uh, class Gastropoda. So these are really snails that, as adults, have shucked their shell. Uh, and they have beautiful uh, forms. They breathe through these branchial plumes on their backs. Um, and so these are closely related to uh, snails. That's actually one of those is called Anna's Magnificent Slug, which I like the name. This is a, an octopus, a big red octopus. They have no bones. And if, if uh, you know anyone that's keeping an octopus, it may or may, I, I don't know what the legalities are, but they're great escape artists. If you don't have bones, it's, uh, you know, a big octopus can get through a, a relatively small hole. And uh, they're quite good at escaping from aquaria, crawling across the room to go eat something out of another aquaria, and then crawling back into their original one. <laughs> um, here is an echinoderm, a crinoid. Oh, the common name is a walking feather star. Here's a red-lined sea cucumber. Um, now we're into some chondrichthys, uh, the beginnings of some vertebrates. And the, the invertebrates I showed you previously were the invertebrates that are most closely related uh, to the vertebrates, which I'll start showing you now. So here's a white-spotted eagle ray. <clears throat> Here is a white shark with what used to be a seal in its mouth. It's amazing how flat you can get and when things are going bad. Um, Here is a pipefish that could pass as a plant, I suppose. Pipefish are very interesting. Uh, in many of the species, the males incubate the eggs. <clears throat> Here's a giant frogfish, which has been known to hang out near sponges and try to uh, pick off unsuspecting prey. Here is a tadpole becoming a frog. If anybody wants to think about transitional forms, you could just think about the entire class amphibia. Every one of these is tr transitional, where they still require water for their eggs, but they uh, spend a great deal of time on land. Um, here is a series of pictures of um, turtles showing some of the major lineages of them. Here's a green sea turtle. Here's a uh, eastern snake-necked turtle, leopard tortoise, and an aldobrin tortoise. Some of these can get to be uh, very big. There's one recently that, that died last week that was born in the late 1700s. I forget exactly where it was. Um, but they can have very, very slow metabolisms. And um, this may be related to a successful old age. Here is a saltwater crocodile, picture taken in Australia. Um, so this is another major lineage within Reptilia. Here is a photo of a thorny devil near Alice Springs in Australia. Uh, they specialize in eating ants. If predators show up, they duck down their head and present with this false head, which looks a little bit threatening. Uh, the regular head looks threatening as well to me. <laughs> and the stuff they eat, you wouldn't believe. Very nasty tasting. Um, another primary lineage of Reptilia are the birds. <clears throat> I didn't show any pictures of dinosaurs, but birds have arisen from dinosauria. 
Uh, this is just a page showing a bunch of honey creepers and tanagers. Here is perhaps the high point of avian biology, a peregrine falcon. And you may have heard that there is a pair that has been hanging out a little bit on the, uh, the bell tower. They still seem to be around. Um, here is the closest thing within our own uh, class to, a, to birds, um, the bats. This particular one happens to be a pallid bat with uh, an arthropod prey item. So that's just a real quick review of a lot of different kinds of um, organisms, and we've had a look at um, some of the primary groups. Here is an electron micrograph of um, a cell, presumably a, a human blood cell of some kind, and a bunch of HIV. These are individual virions which are budding out. Are these things alive? What do we do with viruses if we're talking about the diversity of life? Um, well, let's, let's talk about that. We think we, you know, we, we sort of take it for granted that we know what life is. Um, but it's not, it may be more gray than we think because the, the, uh, the literature within virology considers viruses not to be alive. They're just considered chemicals, basically. Uh, and largely because they're obligate parasites. But I don't see why that should, when we have plenty of life forms that are obligate parasites, uh, that shouldn't be, they, sh they shouldn't be discriminated against just for that. Uh, so how do we diagnose life, um, since we're interested in the tree of life? Well, uh, life forms should have structural organization based on heritable DNA. Viruses have that, DNA or RNA. They should reproduce. Viruses are fantastic mm -hmm. at that. Of course, they do need to use their host's replication machinery to get that done, but still, they reproduce. And in some cases now, we're finding viruses that are able to encode some aspects uh, of the replication process. Um, life forms use material resources from the environment. Sure, viruses do that. They maintain internal homeostatic controls. Viruses do that. Diversity in form and functions of parts. Oh, yeah. Uh, adjust to changing conditions over time. Viruses are extremely good at that um, over short periods of time even. And we expect that life forms will be able to evolve, and viruses do. And in fact, it's their evolution which keeps so many people busy uh, in the biomedical industry uh, or fields, put it that way. So it makes sense to think of viruses as being alive. I showed you earlier, when I talked about evidence for evolution, some range maps and showing the de geographic distribution of organisms uh, and close relatives being near each other geographically. We find the exact same thing when we look at um, a series of populations for HIV. <clears throat> um, the colors here for, uh, represent large samples of HIV that are circulating in their human hosts, and the colors represent different uh, forms of their genome, different haplotypes. Uh, and you can see that we find a clustering of red nearby each other, then some clusterings of blue, uh, and clusterings of green elsewhere. This, this green haplotype or genotype has been very successful in spreading. So it's clear that uh, they are evolving uh, much like any other life form. And we can track this evolution. And we find that the earliest splits for HIV, in fact, are amongst the forms that are circulating broadly in Africa, just as we find within our own uh, within our own species, our own uh, group of organisms. Uh, so there's a case to be made for viruses being alive. And if we're talking, you know, this is sort of the age of discovery in many ways for microbial life forms. I thought I would just show a couple um, quick slides about some of the um, projects going on that are come under the heading of metagenomics, where you're doing this sort of environmental sampling and just sequencing whatever you get out of uh, places like the ocean. Um, so this is showing one of the, um, the sampling rigs. You just drop this down uh, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of feet and uh, with a remote control uncap these cylinders to collect water at different levels. Um, here's another diagram. So here we're going down a total of 13,000 feet. Here's a little blow up of this one area showing the photic zone. Uh, and the collections within the photic zone. And here's sort of a summary of uh, some of the findings is that microbes whose DNA is sequenced from these water samples, uh, and this, these microbes will include both bacteria uh, as well as viruses. Here's the percentages of unique DNAs that are found at these different levels. 
So even at 40 feet, there's still 20% of everything that's being sequenced is brand new. These are life forms that hadn't been uh, uh, looked at before. Uh, 200 feet, 35%, 400 feet, 20%. So there's not a linear correlation here at all, but um, you can see even going down uh, 13,000 feet, nearly a quarter of everything that is sequenced is brand new. It's not in the databases at all. Um, and so people are still trying to figure out exactly uh, what is going on there or what these organisms might be, how they would fit into the tree of life. Here is a diagram of something that we might call the, the virus sphere. It's just a summary of the diversity uh, of viruses, our growing understanding of these um, very interesting organisms that have their unique evolutionary trajectories. And uh, we're beginning to get a handle on uh, the diversity of these organisms that are there and trying to fit them together uh, using phylogenetic methods and to connect them in many ways to the tree of non-virus life forms by the genes that they share. There are many shared genes between viruses and non-viruses. And it turns out, uh, I think one of the big stories in the next 10 to 20 years is gonna be the role of viruses in contributing to the evolution of other life forms. Here is a picture of a recently discovered virus known as the mimivirus. It's the largest uh, virus known so far. Its genome is about 1.2 million base pairs, or 1.2 megabases. Uh, its genome then is larger than, than uh, many bacteria, not most, but many bacteria. And um, so it's sort of blurring the distinction in size between viruses and other forms of life. <clears throat> and sequencing the genome of mimivirus, which was isolated from an amoeba, uh, as well as some of its relatives is showing a lot of homologous genes. These are the same genes in viruses and non-virus life forms. So here's just a list of genes uh, that are found both in viruses and non-viruses, and in some cases, humans. Uh, various DNA polymerases, there's lots of different kinds. Um, replicative helicases, things that unwind DNA from the um, the scaffolding of the chromosome, uh, and so on. So this is a sort of a developing story about the extent to which there is sharing of genetic material by things like viruses and non-viruses, as well as sharing of genetic material between lots of different kinds of non-viruses, and in particular, um, different kinds of bacteria. And so if we, if we look at this diagram, and if here we've got, um, uh, let's see, let's say we've, well, let's just say these are, these are two bacterial clades over here and here are eukaryotes. We know that there's an increasingly complex picture of sharing of genes and genetic elements across all forms of life. It's particularly rampant among bacteria themselves to the extent where some biologists question whether the tree structure can be recovered. And the argument on the extremes are, no, you can't, and yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> and those that say, yes, you can, focus on a certain set of core genes and say, we can take this core set of functionally important genes and come up with a structure. And so this is currently playing out. And um, you know, depending on which particular genes you look at, uh, you can fuel an argument in one direction or another. But clearly there is a lot, of, you can always find the gene trees, and so there's a lot of structure to be recovered there. But so for a moment now, let's continue just in talking about um, the primary structure of the tree of life. We can talk about the core set of genes. Um, everything here in lavender, I think these are um, bacteria with a capital B. In green are archaea, and in red, these are the metazoa. This would include us in here. Uh, and so how do we put a tree for all these different organisms together? How can we possibly compare things as disparate as a uh, bacteria that lives in a thermal hot springs and ourselves? <clears throat> and how do we deal with the great diversity, the, the great numbers of taxa that there are? Here's just a table showing the number of possible rooted trees, the, the different kinds of tree topologies you can have depending on the number of species. So if you've got only three species, there's only three different sets of relationships possible. If you have 10, there's a lot. Uh, 
If you have 100, there's this number times 10 to the 195th. There's a huge number of possible configurations uh, for all the different lineages, all the different what we would, we're trying to get a handle on as far as species. And of course, this number for just 100 of taxa, the number of possible tree topologies is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's going to be hard to, to try to assess every single possible topology in an empirical sense. We, we need to use some heuristic tools to do that. But we're getting better and better at that. What sorts of characters will be used? This is just showing the growth of sequences, um, individual linear strings of sequences in gene bank, and the number of base pairs of DNA in billions over time. And you can see this uh, uh, <clears throat> exponential increase um, just in recent time, going up to 2005. So we've got increasing amounts of genetic data uh, to use. And of course, as we're getting more signal, we're also getting a lot more noise in all of that. Uh, so it's a real challenge. It's a computational challenge. And as far as talking about that challenge uh, in the minutes I have left, I want to just sort of give you something of a, of a metaphorical look at how um, biologists and uh, computer scientists and bioinformaticians and evolutionary biologists are trying to make sense of that. And it's, it's fun to talk about um, this um, person, Charles L. Dodgson. Um, who was a, had a serious interest in mathematics, and he also liked to write. He may be more familiar to you as Lewis Carroll, and I would suggest that it's possible to think about him as um, being uh, unintentionally helping to give us a, a preview of what bioinformatics would become um, 100 years uh, after his death. You're familiar with the phrase, "'Twas brillig in the slithy toes did gyre and gimbal in the wabe," that he wrote in Jabberwocky. And so the question is, well, what do you do with brillig? What is that? So if you're an evolutionary biologist, you immediately start wanting to do something like this. Here you got brillig, and you want to do an alignment with the word broiling uh, to see how many changes there are between these two different words. See what you have to invoke as either gaps or uh, substitutions between them. And he had, in, in the writing itself, Humpty Dumpty talked about brillig meaning 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you begin broiling things, which is where I got the word broiling, uh, to start taking a look at this. And this isn't by coincidence. Uh, uh, Lewis Carroll loved the sorts of wordplay, plays with letters, doing permutations on rearranging the letters within words. Um, he was an inventor of the doublet puzzles. Uh, and here's one shown at the top. And what you want to do here is, given two words at the end, you want to find, of the same length, the same number of letters, you want to find the valid intervening words. So if you want to go from ape to man in six simple steps with a single letter change and having a word that makes sense uh, in every interval, this is the way to do it. Maybe there's a shorter one. Maybe someone out there can think of one. So you can go from ape and change the P to an R, and you get R, and then you can go from R to get air, and air to get air, and air to get ear, to get mar, to get man. Um, this is in many ways sort of like uh, changing of nucleic acids within a codon to come up with different amino acids, to come up with different sorts of protein structures. You can expand the same sort of uh, exercise um, to an issue with sets. So given the set of words in the bottom row, find the minimal tree with valid English words at each interior node with one mutation per connection. Um, this is a fascinating puzzle. So you've got these words at the end, and you want to connect them up here through a series of nodes which have meaning. So this is like taking some sequences from known taxa and seeing the uh, reconstructing the ancestral sequences at these nodes uh, as you go back in time. So now that we have the genetic material, uh, and we actually configure it, and um, we understand these chemicals in terms of letters. Uh, it makes for an interesting set of parallels. So analogous operations for evolutionary biologists include phylogenetic reconstruction, searching for common gene expression patterns among cells, organs, um, and species, graphing of gene networks, showing protein-protein interactions, all of them 
use some of these same sort of uh, puzzle solving capabilities. Lewis Carroll was also fond of uh, syzygies, and this is successively linking words sharing one or more letters. And you can be constrained by a scoring scheme for mismatches and letter changes. Uh, so, so evolutionary biologists do these things to try to uh, look at that portion of the record of change in DNA sequences that's maintained in different taxa. Uh, Lewis Carroll is sort of having a good time looking for changes in letters uh, and what they do to particular words. So he can form these syzygies, which isn't a term from astronomy, meaning alignment. Alignments of planets are syzygies. Uh, walrus, peruse, sharper, carpenter. And of course, then he finds ways to work these into his writings. So this is analogous operations for evolutionary biologists to multiple alignments of amino acids uh, and DNA sequences. Segmentation is also quite important. How you, you have a, you have a, a series of um, digits or letters and how you introduce gaps into them and what that does to change the meaning is very interesting. Um, and so think for a minute about taking this phrase, in every ode linger many, and how could you just change the segments there to come up with something a little bit different? <laughs> and this happens in evolution at the molecular level. You can just change uh, the segmentation uh, to change the reading frame for a sequence string. There are some sequence strings that are read in overlapping reading frames. So where if you start here and go to here, you'll get one meaning. If you move in and start in a different spot, you can get a different meaning from the exact same string. Uh, here's another segmentation exercise uh, of Lewis Carroll's in the form of a riddle. Dreaming of apples on a wall and dreaming often, dear, I, I dreamed that if I count it all, how many would appear? <clears throat> it's a riddle. Where's the answer? Well, the answer can be solved by changing the segmentation. Dreaming of apples on a wall and dreaming of 10, dear, I dreamed that if I counted all, how many would appear? Did he actually think a lot of people were going to read his stuff and start playing with the segmentation? Uh, I don't know. His expectations were high. Or maybe he just did this for his own amusement and uh, for that of some of his friends. But clearly, he was um, thinking along the lines uh, in, a, in sort of an evolutionary bioinformaticist kind of context. And this is analogous to sequence alignment with gaps detecting gene, exon, intron boundaries, overlapping reading frames, alternative splicing sites, predicting protein secondary structures, all these things which people are trying to do when they have to do annotations for the growing uh, database of DNA sequences. And believe me, there's a lot of really lousy annotations out there. And when stuff is getting sequenced much faster than you can apply quality annotations. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to be slamming annotators to any degree. I just, it, it's a huge task. Um, portmanteaus is another uh, exercise of Lewis Carroll's that had some um, parallels uh, with the th kinds of things that a molecular evolutionist is interested in. Um, portmanteau is when you take two words and make something of a combination. Uh, and they're actually, portmanteau itself is a portmanteau. It's uh, from portier and manteau. It's a suitcase that you would fold together, these two halves that fold together and you string them together. <clears throat> I mean, you, you put them together to make a single, a single word. Um, one that uh, Lewis Carroll mm -hmm. Coined, which has caught on to a degree, is chortle, is sort of a cross between chuckle and snort, burble between bleat and murmur, and here are some others. Bit is a combination, it's a portmanteau of binary and digit, bionic, biology and electronic, brash, bold and rash, televangelist needs no explanation, <laughs> workaholic needs no explanation. This is all analogous to recombination. This is a tremendously successful phenomenon as far as coming up with evolutionary novelties at the molecular level. You, you jumble parts of genes together and you just see what works.
Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program.